Uh, Nathan's greatest education comes from raising seven children with his beautiful wife in their Red Desert home. Nathan is the facilitator on the Red Rock Seminary podcast, and his presentation is titled uh, Obtaining a Land of Promise. And like I say, I'm trying to get back on schedule, so I'm going to give it right up to Nathan. So take your seats. All right. I'm certainly grateful for all of you being here today. Um, not only am I thankful for each and every one of you that have come out here today because of your earnest desire to learn uh, from the Word of God and from each other, and hopefully, with God's grace and help of the Holy Ghost, um, I am grateful to all of the other family members who are not here with us, who are making it possible for us to be here. Um, there's, I know for me, I've got some older children that are watching some of my younger children. And so there, it takes a lot of people to, uh, to put something together like this and grateful certainly for Eric and the Zarahemla Foundation making these facilities and this conference available and, and uh, the blessing that it is for us. Um, are we able to turn that projector on temporarily? Is there a magic trick to that? Um, if you go to page 20 of your book, it's beautiful because he basically just, I, had, I handed him a list of scriptures and Eric had the good sense to actually just have the scriptures written out in your book so that we don't have to go chasing it through the uh, scriptures. But, um, but you'll notice at the top of page 20, it says the tale of, of Torah and two kings. And that was uh, originally going to be the title of my talk. And then, um, let's see. Yeah, no worries. So I'm going to basically give you the list of scriptures that was going to be for that talk. And uh, and you can write them down real quick. You but yeah, can we hopefully make that go up on there. Yes. Yeah, and then that way it will be the quickest way for me to convey to you essentially what was going to be the other talk that I was originally going to give. And then I pulled the switcheroo on Eric. And uh, which is not a good thing. It'll take me a while. Just yeah, anyway. Um, so just to give you the, so really under where it says the tale of two Torah, uh, the tale of Torah and two kings, sorry, not two Torahs, I'm sorry, when we were in two Torahs, there's one Torah. But um, uh, it is the tale of Torah Jesus. Uh, that's actually uh, underneath it. I would write obtaining a land of promise because that's actually really the title of this lesson. That with all the scriptures over the next eight nine pages are about. Um, we're gonna one of the principal things uh, in the Book of Mormon and in the Torah is the idea of obtaining a land of promise, and uh, and you'll. You'll actually note that the first five books of Moses, um, uh, particularly, uh, it's it's throughout the whole thing. I'm going to try and show you a pattern, and once you see this pattern, you're going to see it everywhere. I just drew a couple of quick examples. Um, this is the Old Testament. This is the tabernacle. This is also uh, the temple, the Jerusalem. Uh, this is also uh, LDS temple. Uh, you don't see it uh, mapped out that way, but it has the, the temple cosmology is the same throughout. But um, so obtaining a land of promise. Let's get right into it, and I'll give you the notes for the tale of Torah and two kings because uh, the story of King Benjamin, King Benjamin and King Noah, in contrast to each other, are is the story of of a righteous king priest versus the kings that uh, God warned Israel about. And it's really imperative to understand what God's showing us in the Old Testament. And interestingly, we have the uh, three principal kings of Israel and, and they're a representation of the, uh, they're a representation of why we don't have or should not have earthly kings. We should only have one king. Um, and you'll notice there's no positive examples of a positive king priest until, does anybody want to guess who? 
Anybody think who is the greatest example of a righteous king priest? Melchizedek was a great example. Um, he preceded the kingdom of Israel. So, and I, and that wasn't a fair question because I didn't, didn't make the clarification there. So, in, in Deuteronomy 17, uh, God outlines what he expects. For, he's like, he first of all, tries to persuade them not to have a king, to really only let him be their king. But they insist if you're going to have a king, this is what's required. And he outlined that in Deuteronomy 17. And, and Israel promptly flops in the, in the king-making business, grandly, until Jesus Christ himself came. So you're right. Melchizedek is the principal example of a righteous king priest preceding Deuteronomy 17 and Israel. But after Deuteronomy 17 and Israel, Jesus Christ is the eminent example of the righteous king priest, correct? Now, interestingly, in the Book of Mormon, you have King Benjamin, and then just a few chapters later, you have King Noah, and they provide a powerful contrast, of the, and I was going to explore that with you. So I'm going to um, give you those verses in a bit, but we're going to talk about obtaining the land of promise because I believe that uh, if you go through the process of obtaining the land of promise, you're going to figure out the whole king priest business. I think I, would, I had a cart and horse issue, I, and I realized that when I was getting this lesson ready because I was talking about Old Testament, you know, being a righteous king priest, and then I went into and explored that the Book of Mormon with you, and then I realized, well, the whole point of this business is to obtain the land of promise. We got to get in there because, uh, as yeah, I forgot your name, but I'm sorry, you want it. Yes, uh, as Ioana was illustrating, you've got to, uh, to have a kingdom, you've got to have a place where that kingdom will be. But anyway, I'm getting, uh, let's go to page 20. Let's jump right into this. Um, you'll see that the first set of scriptures I have here is Genesis 1 through uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 31. And uh, I would challenge you uh, to just grab a pen and in the next uh, one minute, I would invite you to highlight all the points where the Lord sets bounds in this first chapter of the Bible. Okay? Just mark down where the Lord divides and sets boundaries for things. And uh, I'll give you one minute to do it. It's going to be a speed reading competition. But uh, I'm going to chat at you while you're doing this little exercise. But um, one of the first things understand is that Jehovah or uh, God has set boundaries for us. And this is not a small matter, especially in today's world and political climate. Um, we need to understand that there are bounds and boundaries. God established those things. And the thing I want you to consider when it comes to this concept of setting bounds and boundaries is to contemplate what it must have been like in our pre-mortal existence. We understand from the Doctrine and Covenants that there were many stages in our development. There were many estates. And in our prior estate, we were intelligences. We, uh, we were little sparks of self-aware intelligence. And these little sparks of intelligence, self-aware intelligence, they realized that there was a being out there we call God, and they were drawn to that. They were drawn to his life. And so those sparks of self-aware intelligence that were drawn to him and moved towards him, he trained, taught, he helped them grow, uh, state upon a state, and, uh, and eventually they inherited the spirit body, okay? And then those uh, sparks of self intelligence that were given spirit body. They were again nurtured, grew, trained, were. But there was, if you can think about this, the only, there wasn't any real contrast. There was only brought closer to this greater light, this God, or there was not. There wasn't any contrast. And so there came a point in our development where we were stunted because there weren't bounds. Does that make sense? There was God, 
and moving towards them or not. And that was it. There wasn't a lot of room for growth. And so if you can imagine hitting that barrier, you know, and Abraham chapter three talks about this extensively. He says, you know, there are greater and lesser stars and where there, and just like there's greater and lesser stars, there's greater and lesser, where you have a spirit, there'll be one greater than him and then there'll be another greater than them. And I, the Lord God, I'm greater than them all. You're, they're not even, in the, we're not even playing in the same game, on the same field. And so, um, all right, I'm curious, how many of you, how many of you came up with at least one point of the Lord creating a boundary of division? Okay, two, yeah, let's do it this way. Everybody raise your hand, okay? You have one, raise your hand. You have two, keep it up. Three, four, five, Six, seven, I saw a few hands drop. How many have eight or more? Okay, nine or more? Ten or more? All right, you're the winner. I don't know what you win, other than a student. I got nine, but I was just doing this like, there were, I, I counted nine, and there probably are more. I, I think it would be a matter of, you know, how much we uh, started the, uh, discerning between the lines and things as well. But I counted at least nine, that was me. Some of you got more, some of you points where the Lord created divisions or boundaries. And uh, this is imperative to understand that this is a fact and a reality. And this, I'm gonna give you something real quick in terms of talking to our, to our children, because uh, if you haven't heard me talk before, you'll understand one of the most important reasons I get up here and do this is because I wanna become a good one. And, you, and actually, You'll appreciate this because he hangs out with the Jewish brothers all the time. Uh, a, a wise rabbi will ask you, how do you know if you're a good Jew? And if you ask a wise rabbi that, you know this is how you know he's wise. So he answers and says, if his grandchildren are Jewish. And I feel that same way about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ of Mormon. I'm going to find out if I'm a good Mormon, if my grandchildren are good Mormons. That's, that's going to be kind of the ultimate litmus test. Because it's fine for me to have a testimony conviction. If I'm not able to intergenerationally transmit this testimony and this conviction and these values to my children, have them give it to their children, I'm in the family forever business. And I think everyone in this room is as well. And so this is, this is what we're in for. And so um, they need to understand that there are families and that the world is black and white. The world likes to tell you that there's grays, there's no gray areas. If you're, I was a printer when I very first married my wife, I'm sorry. I repented real quick and got me a good corporate Babylonian job, okay? Um, but, so that I could feed my children. But when it's interesting, when you print things, if you look at a magazine, if you even look at this book and put it under a printer's loop, if there's any grays, it's actually still black and white. It's just how much they saturate that dot. If it's a light gray, there's only a tiny uh, pinprick of black in that dot. If it's black, a heavy black, it's saturated with ink. Um, gray is nothing but black and white, but more defined. And you need to have the discernment to be able to go into the gray and parse between the black and the white. And this is part of understanding the idea that there are boundaries. Anytime you run into a gray area, it's a discernment issue. It's not a, a uh, lack of black and white. Does that make sense to you, brother and sister? That's a challenging idea. And I might be, uh, and I hope I'm challenging you. And by the way, if you think anything I'm saying is crazy, so like search the scriptures, pray it out, and figure out. And I, could, I have these kind of criminal looking eyebrows here, so I could be taking all of this up. Okay? But I want you to understand that the Lord has set boundaries. And, and he did this for a purpose. And let's flip out. And I gave the example of creation. If you look at the next one at the bottom of page 21, um, he set boundaries with Adam and Eve. That's among the first things he did after he set them in the garden. He's like, you can eat up anything, in the, any fruit of any tree in this garden, except for tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So that was the very first boundary he set up. And this was, and you had these two innocent tree, 
creatures placed on this planet. And the very first thing they promptly did was walk right all over that boundary, right? And that was good. It was necessary, okay? If you look at the uh, top of page 22, in Genesis 2.21, um, we have an interesting uh, foreshadow here. There was the division or the boundary set between men and women. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of confusion about that today. And why it's very good to be Mormon. Oh, stop moving around. It's kind of great. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is kind of great. Um, but we can gratefully tell our grandchildren that guess what? The Lord set up this boundary. And there's this boundary called man, and there's this boundary called woman. Now, what's interesting about this is where if he creates the boundary, you'll notice just two verses down, for this cause will there be a boundary or separation between parents and children when children grow off and unite and become one flesh with their spouses. So this is kind of an interesting foreshadow because we, while the Lord has set these bounds and boundaries, we can come to a point where we reunite some of these boundaries, but it has to be done under covenant. And we're going to explore this process because this has everything to do with obtaining the land of promise. Okay. The, uh, um, so here we are, uh, middle of page 22. We're going to explore the reasons why. Because right here, Lehi's on his deathbed and he's got a couple of clueless children. Um, they were Laman and Lemuel. <laughs> and then he's got some clued in children. Uh, you know who they were. Um, but he's on his deathbed, and he's given him his last lecture to his children. And he talks about these boundaries, and he starts by outlining creation. And that's at the middle of page 22 in 2 Nephi 14 through 30. Then he creates another interesting distinction in this idea of creation. He says that there are things that act, and there are things that are acted upon. So when I talk to you guys about that spark of self-aware intelligence, those are things that act. And then there's matter, the, the stuff that's acted upon. And then there's God and truth, which mediates between the two. He sets the laws and the boundaries. That's where we get physics and all these other fun things, chemistry, all that fun stuff where the, where the creatures that act mess around with the stuff that the creator's given us. And he set the truth and he set the boundaries and laws that govern that interaction. And, uh, and that thing trend is, um, well, DNC uh, section uh, 26, one of the most important sections. Oh, got that to work, right? Or, no, never mind. Um, okay, brothers and sisters, grab your pens. I'm going to give this to you real fast. At the very top of page 20, above where it says the tale of Torah and two kings, write the following um, seven references. Deuteronomy 17, 15 through 20. You're going to have to study this on your own time. But Deuteronomy 17, verses 15 through 20. Okay. Then uh, underneath that, right, Mosiah chapter 2, 11 through 25. Mosiah chapter 2, 11 through 25. You're going to contrast those verses with Mosiah 11. 1 through 19. This is basically King Benjamin in chapter 2 literally goes verse by verse from Deuteronomy 17 and shows you how he complies with Deuteronomy 17 out of the Torah. Okay, and then you get to contrast that with Noah who goes and breaks every single rule in Deuteronomy 17. And that's Mosiah 11, 1 through 19. Underneath that, you're going to write the reference for JST. Genesis 14, JST, Genesis chapter 14, verses 25 through 40. Then your next reference after JST, Genesis chapter 14, 25 through 40, is going to be Doctrine and Covenants 84, the whole chapter. But if you want kind of the crux of it, and I'm serious, DNC 84, it's the whole chapter. Um, it's third verses 33 through 40. Then DNC 107, verses 1 through 5. 
DNC 107, 1 through 5, and then DNC 121. Uh, you could literally do DNC 121 and 122 all together. They were both received by Joseph Smith in, ironically, Liberty Jail. Um, yeah, we're never going to come up with a dumb name for how about not Liberty Jail? Like the rule? Like, you know, are we free or not? Right, yeah. Like, yeah. So DNC 121, 34 through 46. And then Alma 13, a whole chapter. And I can't even give you a cross on that one. You gotta just do the whole thing. That, if I were, if we were to do tale of Torah and two king, there would be your scriptural references in a nutshell. And there's probably a half a dozen more. Yes, sister? Alma Alma chapter 13, a whole enchilada. And I'm really excited, sister, that you're interested in this because gals, you're a part of this. Um, you can't really have a righteous king priest with out, uh, yeah, uh, here's how I'll illustrate this for you, sister. Um, do you know how they uh, select um, state presidents in the LDS church? It's supposed to be by revelation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clue you in here, right? Um, what they do is they find somebody who is generally righteous, you know, striving to keep the commandments. They find somebody who has good communication skills, personable, kind, you know, hopefully exemplify some Christ-like charity and love, and then they call their husband. Okay. So, uh, gentlemen, if you want a big clue on how to become a righteous king priest, you better find a partner that you're, who's better yoked than you are. Okay. Um, so anyway, so I'm glad you're interested in the subject. But yeah, so anyway, there now you have all the references. Sorry, now we're going to go back to Lehi and his discussion. If you go over to page 23, I'm bouncing around the board, but we're going to get there. Um, if you look at verse 22, uh, this is the reason why Lehi says that God created everything and he created all these boundaries and these divisions. He says in verse 22, and now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, boundary of the priest, right? He's not transgressed, he would not have fallen. I mean, he would have and he would have remained in the Garden of Eden. And all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created. And must have remained forever and have no end. This is where I'm telling you that was the condition we found ourselves in our previous state. We were these sparks of self-aware intelligences that started moving toward God, great light, and we got a spirit body. We were in the same state that we were created in because there was not these boundaries, okay? And you'll see this in 23. And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in that state of innocence. Now that is an interesting commentary on having children, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, I remember before I was married, me and my fiance, we'd march around the grocery store looking at all those terribly damaged children. <laughs> children will never do that. <laughs> yeah, and after you have about five, six, seven children, you lose all sense of that sort of gender and confirmation. Oh, yeah. The innocence is gone. Now I see a kid misbehaving in the grocery store. I'm like, well, over to mom, I'm like, I'm, I'll, I'll hold you much. We got this. We're double teaming us, right? Anyway, um, they would have had no children where they, they would have remained in state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery doing no good because they knew no sin. Okay, but behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Okay, so the first part of understanding obtaining the land of promise is understanding the state and condition that we live in the world now, created by him who knows all things, that has these boundaries and distinction. There is a land of promise, and we now have a place of contrast. Now, um, the whole rest of these verses are definitely worthy of reading, and but flip over to page 24, and here you'll see, I give you from the scripture, several examples of the fact that we are in a lost and fallen state. And you'll see here, and the very first verse has to do with Adam and Eve. They were our first parents, and the first pattern we see in the scriptures of this idea, Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. Right in the Garden of Eden, we walked and talked with God face to face. 
then they transgress that boundary. Or it's like I gave you boundaries and uh, you transgressed it. It's too great. So that's why I put the boundary there. You were going to stop all over it. And now you're going to learn. And they were cast out from the garden. And for a period of time, they could hear God's voice from the garden, correct? And then there came a point where they couldn't hear God's voice anymore. And God sent them angels or what we call true messengers. Now, this true messengers can either literally be an angel sent from the presence of God. Something dramatic like Gabriel, or even more dramatic like the one who came to Alma the Younger. If I were ever going to sign up for an angel job, I want to be the Alma the Younger angel. I do. Like, like with the lightsaber, like the flaming sword. Like all the other angels, they show up and they're like, I am not Gabriel, send me the presence of God. You're not. The Alma the Younger angel, he showed up and he's like, He's like, you have reason to fear. <laughs> like, it was like Arnold Schwartz an angel. It was great. I want that job. You have a foolish fear. You have been a very bad boy. And I will end you. Yeah, it's such it's like a great thing. I had a really active imagination when I was a deacon and a teacher. You really don't want to be in my head when I read scriptures. Actually, you kind of would. It would be a very popular YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Adam and Eve, they got messengers from the Father. But I want you to realize, just like in, in 2 Nephi 32, these can be mortal beings. If you speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, if you're testifying of Christ, and you speak the words of Christ, then you're a messenger, you're an angel. Oh, that I could speak with the tongue of an angel, right? So these true messengers can either be, you know, prophets, apostles, or anyone filled with the Holy Ghost, all the way to angels who come from the presence of the Father. And then, um, and then there's the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. So, and Adam recorded was, we find that he recorded the first scriptures so they could give them to his posterity, and he prophesied to him by the gift of the Spirit. Okay. And then there's being lost in darkness. And so this was the descent of Adam and Eve, and then uh, and their posterity. The goal is, is for us to <clears throat> take that journey back, to obtain the words of God, and to understand them by the Holy Ghost, to obtain true messengers of the Father, and then to obtain his voice, and then to eventually obtain his presence. This is, bluntly, in a nutshell, this right here, is really what we're talking about. So if you look here, the first verse that I give you, Moses 5.4, is dealing with Adam. Then I deal with the children of Israel in Exodus 1, 6 through 8, talking about their lost and fallen condition. Okay. So the children of Israel, they, um, as a whole nation, they were lost and fallen. They've been in bondage for about 400 years. They've lost their language. They've lost their culture. They've lost their understanding. They thought they had priesthood, but what they had was a little thing that they were passing around among each other, but they didn't really understand how it worked or what it did. In fact, Jethro had to re-give Israel the priesthood through Moses. Um, and Jethro was a Midianite and a son of Israel. That's a whole fun story there. But, um, and I think there's application today. I think you'd agree. Um, and then uh, we talk about uh, Israel when they cross over the Jordan, and then of course the uh, example that we brought up in the previous talk about Nephi leaving Jerusalem, okay? And uh, and he went to obtain the land of promise. So here are examples of from Adam to Israel to Lehi and his family, they are going to take this journey. Now for these examples, they're quite literal, okay? And, uh, and the first thing you'll notice is the next step is um, is after you recognize it, after well, you are in a lost and false state, is to awaken. And this is where the scripture, the Holy Ghost, and true messengers come in. At some point, somebody has to shake you awake and make you realize that you are in a lost and fallen condition and that you're in darkness. And you have to awaken to this reality before you can go and obtain a land of promise because you have to realize that A, you're asleep, and B, you're not there. 
Now, as soon as you wake up, you can start making the journey. And you'll see here in the bottom of page 24, I give you some examples and verses. And like I say, I'm giving you examples that follow Adam and Eve, that follow Israel, that follow Lehi's family. Because I want you to start seeing these patterns. Because once you see this pattern, you'll see it everywhere in the scriptures. And the most important part of seeing this pattern is that eventually someday you'll end up following the pattern yourself. This is the goal here. Okay, um, but uh, this is uh, where we were just previously admonished. If you look at the middle of page 25, the next step after awakening is to get up and go. We have to leave Egypt. We have to leave Babylon. And so here are the verses that follow Adam and follow Israel as they literally, and Lehi's family, as they literally get up and go and leave um, uh, Egypt and Babylon. And, uh, and I want to invite you to read those. Um, let's get into, now this is the part of the lesson that I want to key in, so we're going to spend some next, go to page 26. I'm demonstrating the pattern, I'm giving you the verses, uh, but now we're going to talk about traveling through the wilderness. Okay, now I'm going to start hopefully giving you guys some real down-to-earth practical stuff on how to go obtain your land of promise. Because bluntly, uh, if and uh, I've now learned that I get to thank the Pope for this, but I don't know how many of you have ever been in your life where you feel like a little hamster in a wheel. You're running awfully fast, but you don't seem to be going anywhere. And this was the point I found myself a number of years ago. And, uh, and, you know, I was being a good Mormon. I was checking the boxes. I was doing the right thing. You know, I was doing everything that I was told would make me happy and prosperous. And I was waiting for God to shower down his blessings upon me. And the, the, the only thing I seemed to find was uh, that the uh, hamster wheel was occasionally greased so that it didn't squeak while I got to run even faster, right? And get nowhere. And then I had this awakening, um, both spiritually and temporally. And this goes back to DNC 26, and this is actually at the heart of this lesson, which is why at no time have I given a commandment unto the children of men that, that is temporal only, but all commandments are temporal and spiritual unto me. And this is a critical point to understand. This is why I started back with God created bound and the creation and everything like it. this whole thing is a is a sandwich. If you're you feel like I'm prospering um, spiritually, but you're failing temporally, you're missing a piece. You need to, both need to grow. Now, I'm not teaching the prosperity gospel by no means, but I'm trying to make the point that the, there's no commandment that is temporal or spiritual only, but they're, they work in concert. And I had this awakening a number of years ago. And the first thing I realized is how much I had given away my responsibility for everything in my life to everyone and everything else, to every institution, to everyone out there who is willing to, you know, and especially in our hyper consumer, hyper consumerist uh, state, um, you know, Google and Apple and every product that's pimped to you, they're there to make you happy, make you better looking, make you popular with the ladies make you protect your family, like my ring doorbell is going to protect my family. Like, like there's a product to solve every problem of your life. It's funny, we gripe about doctors and pharmacies where they give you a pill for everything. Well, there's a product for everything too. Every part of your life you don't want to take responsibility for, there's a pill or a product there to help you out. And, uh, and I had to awaken to the reality that, nope, I'm responsible for me. I'm responsible for my family, and I need to put myself back in the driver's seat of my life, both spiritually and temporally. And this is where we are traveling through the wilderness. So let's um, let's uh, let's look at what Adam, because Adam did this. You remember, he gets out of the garden. He's out of the presence of God. He hears the voice. The voice shuts down. The Lord, one of the last things He gave him was the law of sacrifice. And he's out there burning sheep on a regular occasion. Angel shows up. He's like, Adam, why are you doing that? Uh, God said so. And Adam's like, what? 
All right, bro. <laughs> this that thou doest, thou doest in similitude. Like, right? He teaches him why he's offering sacrifice, right? And this, by the way, is the moment, and you can see it in Moses 5, where I believe you can see Adam waking up again. And I was intentional about saying the word again. Adam waking up again, because um, uh, let's, who's going to volunteer to read uh, Moses 5, 9, and verse Verses 9 and 14 for me. Got that. Brother, loud, booming voice. You're out of it now. Go for it. And in, and in that day, Moses was called on that. His brethren read it. Record, uh, records the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father, from the beginning, henceforth, and forever. That as thou hast called me, thou mayest be redeemed. And all mankind, even as many as will. And the Lord God called upon men by the Holy Ghost everywhere and commanded them that they should be should repent. Yep. So this is where Adam wakes up and he's like, Holy cow, I gotta get going. You know, uh, I've been kicked out of his presence. You know, I don't long no longer hear his voice. The angel had to give me a wake-up lesson. And now he's like, the Holy Ghost falls on me. He's like, Whoa, there's this redeemer, there's this path, there's this way back. And this is where, hopefully, I'm going to assume some of you in this room have figured out you're lost in darkness. I'm going to assume that some of you have this urge to get up and go and get out of Egypt, okay? If not, I invite you to get lost and then get up and go, okay? But this is where I think we start struggling, and this is where I struggle. As soon as I came to this waking, I'm like, okay, now what do I do? And there's a way to travel through the wilderness. And the first thing to do is to recognize that there's a Messiah who will set a pattern and a path for you. And it will give you the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. And uh, who's going to read for me Moses 6, 5 through 6 for me? All right, Brother Eric Spitt. And the book of remembrance was kept, in the which was recorded in the language of Adam, for it was given unto many as called upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration. And by them their children were taught to read and write, having a language which was pure and undefiled. Okay, and this is where we get to see that this word of God. And now, um, there's an interesting Hebraism right here that I want to just give to you because I feel to do it. So, um, this phrase here, uh, where it said, and if you've got this highlighted in your book, and then eventually go highlight it in your real scriptures, but it says, as many called upon God, called upon God, or calling upon the name. Calling upon the name is a Hebraism. And if I were to give that Hebraism a, a Mormon way of saying it, I would say the true order of prayer. Now, when I say true order of prayer, some of you are going to start thinking about your endowment, which is a good thing to think about. And some of you haven't been endowed or had your endowment. That's fine, because now I want you to start paying extra attention. And I'm not going to give you the look behind the curtain here. But this idea of calling upon God or calling upon the name, if if we were, if I were Joseph Smith and I were having a conversation, we would talk about true order of prayer. But we'd have to talk about what true order of prayer is because there's what the LDS Church teaches about true order of prayer, and there's what's in the scripture. And if I were to give you what is the real true order of prayer, it would be the very interaction between the angel and Adam about the sacrifice he was making. Okay, you have to understand in Hebrew, the word for sacrifice and the word for prayer, they're the same word. Sacrifice and prayer in Hebrew are the same thing. There's no separation between them. Okay? And the funny thing is, is we're really screwed up about this because we totally misunderstand what this concept is. Sacrifice to us, we've been raised in a Western culture with a Greek mindset where you bring your offerings to the altar of Zeus and Zeus looks down and he sees it and he's like kind of tickled because he's like, oh, what a cute little human. He's bringing me the fatted calf. And then because he's pleased and tickled by your cute little offering, um, he showers down his gifts on you. And this is what all the old um, wicked idolatrous gods were about. You go chuck your baby on the lap of Baal, and he showers you with gifts. 
He's the red hot prosperity, the pot belly god of prosperity. Like all these cats were all about you give up something and God looks down and he's tickled by you or he catches fancy. Like you remember all the Greek stories, like Hera was down with this mortal, Zeus was down with this one. So they have, yeah, like all that nonsense. That's what we think of when we think of the word sacrifice. We think of this idea of giving up something. Well, this is a weird concept to break, like you think about it, because what does God own? Everything. Yeah, he owns everything. So exactly what are you giving him? You get one of my point? Like there's nothing you throw on an altar. God's like, thanks. Like it's like a dog giving his master the shoe. Oh, that is my shoe. Thank you. And now it's moistened and gross. Like, what are we doing? It's like, does it make sense when you think about the Greek model? Correctly. But if you understand what Adam and the angel were talking about, he said, this sacrifice you're doing, you do it in similitude of the only begotten who is full of grace and truth. Prayer in Hebrew, or sacrifice in Hebrew, which is the same thing, is when you do something like Christ does it. Does that make sense? Prayer is about aligning your will with God's and doing it God's way. It's not about God as a genie in the bottle that you're making a wish to, right? Did you guys get that? So like calling upon the name, when you really understand what this is and you understand the concept of, of prayer, this will change your life. And by the way, this is, I'm not, I'm telling you this right now because I want you to get that if you have the word of God, and if you understand this concept, you have enough to begin traveling through the most fertile parts of the wilderness. The wilderness you must go through, sorry, there's no shortcut. This is why we do Feast of Tabernacles every year, is to remind you that we're all strangers in a strange land. And no matter how comfortable our homes or how big our boxes get, and how lavishly we adorn them and, and make them comfortable and feather our nests, we're eventually going to take a dirt nap and they're going to stay here and your children are going to fight over them and uh, they're going to go probate and the Pope's going to own them all in the end, right? So, so I want you to get, you're all strangers in a strange land and journey through the wilderness, yes you must, but if you take with you the word of God and you understand how to call upon the name or pray, by the way, I could, um, this whole journey right here, this whole journey right here, this whole journey right here, this whole, this, by the way, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Paul, Paul this is a vessel or a clee, and this is the progression of clees. But anyway, um, but, and this is obviously like celestial terrestrial, celestial kingdom, and then, anyway, this world, the veil, okay. This is the, uh, the old temple. I can put the new temple that have the same cosmology. But if I were to make this, there's a progression here, okay, where you're out here in the lost. And so you start with um, the law of obedience. Then you go to the law of sacrifice or prayer. Then you go to the law of the gospel. Then you go to the law of chastity. And then you go to the law of consecration. Okay, I, I'm, I'm really, not trying to fire hose you, I'm so afraid. I see some of you are like, I think there's a wisdom bomb, but it's got me, and so I'm just kind of laying flat and in recovery from the discussion. Um, but yeah, like, so journey through the wilderness you must, and you're gonna do it with the word and the word of God. Um, let's go to Exodus uh, 20. By the way, I'm mapping this out for you. Remember, um, so uh, when we get to the uh, law of the gospel, the law of the gospel, if I were to give it to you in a nutshell, is you take the Ten Commandments and you marry it to the Sermon on the Mount. That is the best way for me to summarize what the law of the gospel is. You take Sermon on the Mount, the Ten Commandments from Exodus, mash those two up, and do a really hip new tune. That is law of the gospel. And so you'll see I've got Exodus 21 through 17 there. And uh, that is the law of the gospel. And if you follow the law of the gospel, that is what will help you travel through the more fertile parts of the wilderness. Let's go to First Nephi 2, 19 through 20. Who wants to read that for me? Let's get a sister. Bold, ah, sister, spit it for me. Uh, that's going to be First Nephi 2, 19 through 20. It's the... Uh, Shall be led to the land of promise. Yea, even a man of the 
like to pray for you. Yay, allow for Jesus Christ above all of us. Excellent. So faith, diligence, love the gospel or the commandments. Okay. Um, faith is trusting loyalty. Um, faith is trusting loyalty. It's not a mental exertion game. Faith is like marriage. It's trusting loyalty. Um, you want to know how faithful somebody is? Look at how they interact with their spouse. That's serious. By the way, your interaction with your spouse is your children's first lesson on faith in God. When they see that a wife says, okay, husband, I think you're kind of crazy, but I'm just going to roll with your plan for now. Trusting loyalty, right? When the uh, husband does the same thing for a wife, children see that. When God gives you a direction, and you're kind of like, when you're like Adam, uh, I know not, say the Lord commanded me. Uh, apparently, he really likes mutton a lot. It's like, I don't get it, but I'm going to do it. Okay? Stay diligent. It's like Nephi. Like, you know how in the LDS churches, they always like to talk about how the different prophets have kind of a theme? The Nephi. He would have been diligent. Nephi was the diligence dude. Like, he, he, his kids, they got the diligence lesson all the time, right? Like, yeah, 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 you know, diligence. Yeah, well, tell, tell me about it. I had to leave the So, we can get all about the right? Okay, so, faith and diligence, keeping the commandments. This is how you go through the more fertile parts of the wilderness. And this is the same for you. You want to go obtain the land of promise? Just like Adam and Eve did, just like Israel did, just like Lehi's family did. Faith, diligence, keep the commandments. Okay. Um, I will leave you. I'll leave you to the, the rest of the verses in this. Let's get over to crossing over because I got seven minutes to get you into the promised land. Okay. Brother Dills. So you watch this 40 years, but you got seven yeah. minutes. Yes. <laughs> 55 minutes. June Promise Land. Where do I sign up? Yeah. Seven so minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're already <laughs> you're already on the boat, brother. We're, we're going there. Yeah. If if any of you are here after seven minutes, it's because you've got some intent to do. Um, <laughs> but here we are crossing over into the land of promise. Um, if there Joshua 3, uh, so we're on page 28. Joshua 3 is where Israel literally um, the uh, Israel's symbolic mediator was taken up, and Joshua and the children of Israel cross over the Jordan into the promised land. Okay, now you have um, Nephi and his family. He builds a boat, and they cross over the great waters, and they arrive in the Americas, the promised land. Right now, we're on page twenty-nine. Now, this is where I'm going to get real concrete with you. That's where we're going to spend our last six minutes and 17 seconds. Um, who's going to read First Nephi 5, 5, 4 through 6 on page 29 for me? Brother, spit it loud and proud. All right. Uh, 5, 4 through 6. Okay. Now, Nephi, the son of Nephi, said unto Joshua, Behold, I have seen the things of God in a vision. I should not have known the goodness of God. I had tarried in Jerusalem, and I perished with my brethren. But behold, I have obtained the land of promise, in which things I do rejoice. Yet I know that the Lord will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban, and bring them down again unto us in the wilderness. And after this manner of my mission, my father Lehi comfort my mother's survive concerning us, while we journey to the wilderness up to the land of Jerusalem to obtain the record of the promise. These are three very, very rich verses. By the way, you need to understand these verses so that you understand why Lehi's wife and his kids thought he was nuts. Okay? The dude's crazy. They're literally three days journey into the wilderness. So they're just far enough away from Jerusalem that it's really, really unpleasant and uncomfortable. And they are no, they're eight years away from arriving in America. But look very carefully. He says, I have obtained the land of promise. And by the way, he starts out by going, honey, I know I'm crazy. I know I'm nuts. I'm seeing crazy things. Every wife wants to hear that when he's like, just after he sends off his sons to die at the hand of a murderous guy like Laban, right? It's like, yeah, honey, I'm bananas. 
Man, I'm already in the land of promise. Like, I don't know what you've been eating that you found in the desert, but I'm nervous. Like, that's why Laman and Lemuel and all of them at one point or another thought their dad was nuts. Well, I want you really like triple underlined him saying, I have obtained the land of promise. Because this is where the lesson gets real. And let's read Alma 37, 33 through 47. And Farrell, can I pick on you? Will you read that for me from the page 29? He's got this great. Be able. Oh, well. Yep, right there. What? Just start reading, brother. Preach unto them repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to humble themselves and to be meek. Holy in heart, teach them to withstand every temptation of the devil with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to never be weary of good works, but to be meek and lowly in heart, for such shall find rest in their, to their souls. Oh, remember, my son, and learn wisdom in thy youth, yea, learn thy youth to keep the commandments of God. Yea, and cry unto God for all thy support. Yea, all thy doings be unto the Lord. And whatsoever you go, thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Yea, let all thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, let the afflictions of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord, that he may watch over you in your sleep. And when you rise in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. And if ye do these things, ye shall be lifted up in the last day. And let's flip the page, and um, I'm going to actually have you. I'm, I'm actually going to pick up because I've only got a couple minutes to speed read this section. But now, my son, I have somewhat to say to you concerning this thing which our fathers called a ball or a director. That's a liahona being interpreted a compass. The Lord prepared it. For behold, can, uh, no man can create something like it. It works by faith and miracles. Nevertheless, because these miracles were worked by small means, it did show unto them marvelous works. And uh, if they were slothful and did not pay faith and diligence, they got lost. When they were faithful and diligent, they progressed in their journey, journey through the wilderness. And verse 42, um, no, verse 43. And now, my son, I would that you should understand these things are not without a shadow or without another layer of Torah interpretation. For as a, our fathers were slothful and did not give heed to this compass, these things were temporal. They did not prosper, even so with things that are spiritual. For behold, it is easy to give heed to the word of Christ that will point you on the straight course to eternal bliss. And it is for our fathers to give heed on this compass that would point them straight course to the promised land. And now I be now I say, and this is verse 45, is this not a type of a thing? For as surely as the director did bring our fathers by following the course to the promised land, shall the words of Christ, if we follow their course, carry us beyond the veil of sorrows into a far better land of promise. Oh, my son, don't be slothful. Get with the program. We need to obtain a land of promise, both spiritually and temporally. Um, if you guys look at the, the uh, in the New Testament, the Hebrews chapter 6, Deals with the same concept. And you'll see the next quote I got at bottom of 30. Um, I've got a reference from the Bible Dictionary because it brilliantly summarizes it. But if you look at uh, the uh, notation for B, it says, The traveling of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness and crossing over Jordan River into the Promised Land is similar to a man forsaking worldly things, going through the wilderness of temptation, and finally passing through the veil of death into the celestial kingdom. Now, by the way, you don't have to wait till you die to do this either. You can cross over here, just like the River Jordan. So, in closing, brothers and sisters, I invite you to follow the instructions that are given to us in the Torah and most beautifully in the Book of Mormon, who lays it out plain to obtain your land of promise. 
and do it both spiritually and temporally. Don't pursue the spiritual without the temporal, okay? And don't pursue the temporal without the spiritual, okay? My hope is, is that you guys will, you know, give faith and diligence to the commandments of God, travel through the more fertile parts, and obtain the land of promise here and now for your family, for your children and your children's children, and that you will be able, like Lehi, to declare, even if you haven't obtained your temporal land of promise yet, that you have obtained your land of promise uh, in the peace and rest of the Lord, in the uh, in Abraham's bosom, and whatever scriptural term you want to use for passing through the veil and coming back into the presence of God. Questions? Yeah. Or you can shout them out, either one. Good. Wow. Yeah, that's true. Okay. By the way, I can tell that we all have some repenting to do. We're still here. Even though I've given you the keys to to translation and three easy steps. My grandchildren are Mormon as we move forward to Torah. We want them Mormon in the box or Hebrew Mormon. How's it? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, yeah, didn't you like my fifth, every fifth word question? Or something. People who are watching on Zoom. The question is, if my grandchildren are Mormon, question mark, as we move forward to Torah, we will want them Mormon in the box or Hebrew Mormon, or how's the transition done with Mormon or Jew in the box between you? I think what they're asking, and whoever wrote that, tell me if I got it right, but like when you start first learning about Hebrew roots of Mormonism and everything, you, like for me, I went, the, it was like a pendulum. I went like full rabbinical Orthodox Judaism for a while. Like I got lost in there for a little while. And then I had to be like, wait a moment, you know? Um, and then you're like trying to sort of orient yourself. Like, how do I be a Mormon with Hebrew roots? Like uh, my brother-in-law, whose house we're staying right now, he loves to call us Mormon Jewigamous. It's like, <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a really solid mashup of everything, right? It's like, you can't get much more comprehensive than that, right? Um, interestingly, uh, this is the counsel I'd give you. Um, there's a lot of value to be had in, in uh, Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, but this is the way I started sorting through it after a while because one thing that rabbis love to do is rabbis like to quote other rabbis. Just like Mormons love to quote prophets quoting other prophets who quote prophets, right? We, it's all the same game. It's just the names have changed, right? And what I started doing is I started going, every time I ran into something that sounded really profound that a, a rabbinical Orthodox Jew said or taught me, I'd be like, okay, where is that in the scriptures? And as soon as he could show it to me in the scriptures, I'm like, we came. Because as soon as he said, well, our great so-and-so rabbi, butler, dog trainer, once said that he said, like, okay, we lost now. <laughs> so and as soon as Hinckley's son said that Hinckley once said that Benson once said, you know, you get the idea. Or my favorite one in Mormonism is, is uh, Maxwell said it, right? Anything, any quote you can't find, Maxwell said it. It's somewhere. Or McConkie. It was McConkie when I was a kid, but now it's Maxwell. But it just switches every 10 or 20 years. But yeah, that quote about, you know, caffeine and caramelized uh, soda pop being of the devil, that, that was McConkie or Maxwell, you know. It's like, okay. It's like, uh, but so the way I would say it is, is um, always find it back in the word of God. If they can, if they, if they put something in your hands, you're like, that seems cool. If they can say here in the word of God is where it comes from, then you're on pretty solid ground. And that's where I came to the middle. And, uh, and that's what I explained to my children to call themselves when they, when they show up at seminary and they go to school and their friends are like, what are you? Um, I just tell them, say you're Mormon. That's I'm just like, say you're Mormon. And, uh, and because the church doesn't want to be called Mormons anymore. Right. You know that. So it's like, you want to drop that? I'll take it right up. Okay. I'll be a Mormon all day long. Yeah. Okay. So you say you Mormon. And then if they're like, so why do you do this weird thing instead of Christmas? 
my first instinct is to be like, ask them why they do this weird thing called Christmas instead of what's in the scripture. But anyway, don't teach them to be antagonistic. But, um, but uh, what I do is I tell them, like, just say you're Mormon and just say that you never found a commandment you didn't like. <laughs> And you're set. That's it. Because they can show everything that we do in our family in the scriptures. Like, when we do Passover, we're reading from the scriptures. Like, there's no, you'll, if you go to my Passover, by the way, moms, all y'all come talk to me real quick. I got like four minutes. Okay. Moms, come talk to me if y'all stressing about Passover. I'm going to give you the Passover from the scriptures. There's four things. That's it. You do a rabbinical Seder. I did a rabbinical Seder in New York when I was a missionary. The thing is like eight hours long. Like, holy cow. Like, their kids are literally, their side curls are in the plate. Like, they're gone. Like, it's like, it's a war of attrition. It's like, you really get tradition. And these kids are out. Like, but the, the uh, Seder I do has four things on it because those are the four things I can find in Scripture. And we read those Scriptures, you know. And so uh, the thing I teach my wife is, is if you're ever stressing about doing the Feast of Israel, you're probably doing it wrong, okay? Like, don't, don't go. Jews do Passover the way Gentiles do Christmas. Bad business. Don't, don't let the kick the Coke drinking polar bear out of your house. <laughs> and uh, and and kick the kick the twelve step process like Alcoholics Anonymous Seder out of your house. Like just do what's in the scripture. So that will help I answer your question. Um, which angel is most likely to have a double sided lightsaber? Ah, that would be that would be um, Jedi Master Righteousness. Uh, no. Um, uh, uh, how many examples of the land of promise do you think there are in the Book of Mormon? Um, shoot. Uh, this pattern, like I say, you'll see it everywhere. Lehi's, um, by the way, uh, how do I, we, the first and second book of Nephi, you can literally, you have everything you need right there. Um, and by the way, if you, uh, some of you who are like thinking, oh, Brother Dills was talking about the endowment, and I feel so bummed because I don't know if I'll ever have access to it. Don't get stuck on the ordinance that the Orthodox Church sort of yeah. put out. Let me explain to you. You want the endowment? the way Nephi got the endowment. And it's right in front of you. Like, when Joseph Smith gave Mormons the endowment, he said, this is basically a simulation of what you should experience when you have this real experience. And then, just like the ancient Jews did when the Lord handed them the Levitical rites, they started doing the Levitical rites, and they're like, look at this cool thing we do. We do it for God. And they started jumping up and down like, yeah, we all that in a bucket of chicken. And Isaiah ended up having to come a little while later and be guys, what are you doing? The Lord doesn't like mutton. You're missing the point, right? And Mormons, by the way, there's when I say section 84, and this will probably be my closest, yes. Um, temporal and spiritual, how can we be saved without temporal ordinances? Um, you can't. Yeah, you can't be saved without temporal ordinance. Now, some of you are freaking out. But you're stuck on the idea that you get temporal ordinances from other men. That's your only outlet. But you have to look at the whole scriptural history, folks. We've only had two periods in the history of the world in scriptures where you had organized religion the way we do it. Or, well, actually what we do is freakish. Um, but, but somewhat like we do it. And that is the uh, New Testament church after Christ's death. And I want to put an emphasis on that. Christ did not organize the, the way the apostles did. That was a Pauline thing. And I love my apostle Paul, but dude was, I love Paul. I love Paul. Me and Paul, we're going to have words. I love Paul. Um, that dude was, yeah, anyway, I won't get into Paul. I love him though. We got it. Uh, but he's kind of the Bruce Harmon Conkey of the ancient world. He was good for a lot of stuff, but he was also good for a lot of interesting stuff, right? That was Paul. Um, but anyway, my point is, is um, yes, temple ordinances are necessary, but how did Nephi get his? How did Nephi get his endowment? It shows you right there in first and second Nephi. Okay? How did Abraham get his endowment? 
How did these, so like most of the history of the world, we didn't have a church handing out ordinances in the temple. You had the temple in Jerusalem, then you had a Levitical temple in Kirtland, and you had a Melchizedek temple in uh, Nauvoo. And then I have a room full of people that have all sorts of different ideas about temples right now. And, and I'm actually probably more for most of them than you would think. But my point is, is that don't get stuck on the idea that um, the Lord's been giving a temporal endowment to the children of men without temples for more time than he has with the temple. So anyway, any other questions? I got to close this up, right? Brother Stan there. I love you guys. Obtain your land of promise. Amen.